For such a tiny region, this place has an epic history. It's the Holy Land, and it's central to the world's three great monotheistic religions. People have been fighting over this land for centuries, and even today, it continues to stir deep passions around the globe. But regardless of your beliefs, and no matter what you think you already know about this place, when you get here, be ready for some big surprises. Israel and the Palestinian territories occupy the southeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea in a region formerly known as Palestine. In 1948, the state of Israel officially came into being and the shape of the Palestinian territories of Gaza and the West Bank began to emerge. But subsequent wars have altered the borders and conflict continues to this day. Part one of my trip to the Holy Land, I start in the ancient city of Jerusalem. I then head north into the Palestinian West Bank and the city of Ramallah, before moving southeastwards to finish at one of the world's natural wonders, the Dead Sea. The ancient city of Jerusalem is the spiritual heart of the region and important to Muslims, Christians, and Jews. But much of its fame stems from the Bible, where it is known as the City of the Jews, founded by King David. At its center is the Old City, which is made up of four quarters reflecting the religious mix and is encircled by historic fortress walls containing seven entry points, or gates. They say if you want to get a feel for what life might have been like in ancient Jerusalem, this is the gate to enter, Damascus Gate. Damascus Gate takes you into the heart of the Muslim quarter. The markets, or souks here, are the busiest in the old city and have been around for hundreds of years. Nowadays, they sell everything from clothes to religious souvenirs, and of course, the odd local delicacy. What, what are these, hearts? It's hearts of chicken. Chicken hearts? You guys eat the hearts, you like it? Yeah, a lot or no? It's really good. You like the taste too? It looks disgusting. Will you eat one if I eat one? No. No? <laughs> Things look so much better cooked than they do raw. The thought of eating that was kind of disturbing, but this, this actually looks all right. Stick it, stick it all the way through? This, yeah. Oh, I see. I poke it right through. Ow. Squeeze it. All right. We're going to load it up. What is this, like a yogurt? Cucumbers and tomato. I got to disguise the flavor. We will do this half done. Spices, yeah? Yeah. Bon appetit right. for you. Bon appetit. Thank you. Here we go. You just try this on its own. Mm. It's really good. It's kind of sweet. By far the largest area in the Muslim quarter is the Haram Ash Sharif, a religious space dominated by the magnificent Dome of the Rock Shrine. To get inside the Dome of the Rock, you've got to go through these security points, and we're not allowed to film inside, so you're going to have to see it from the outside. Sorry. The Dome of the Rock was built in the 7th century over a rock considered to be holy to both Muslims and Jews. Many Jews believe the site is where Abraham prepared his son to be sacrificed, 
while Muslims claim it played an important role in the life of the Prophet Muhammad. The building you see today has been restored to its original glory, but its dome, once made of gold, is now made of anodized aluminum. We may not be able to film inside, but Globetrekker did back in the 1990s with Justine Shapiro. Here is this holy place is considered very important place for Muslims all around the world, not only for Muslims in the country, because it becomes the third holy place for Muslims after Mecca and Medina. The third holy place yes. after Mecca and Medina. Yes, mm -hmm. and the place where Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven through it. Uh -huh. And in addition to that, a Muslim who is able to reach this place to pray he covered 500 times praying somewhere else. So if he prays here, he doesn't have to pray 500 times? No. If he pray once, here. as if he prays somewhere else 500 oh, times. Oh, if he... So one prayer here equals 500 prayers somewhere anywhere else. else. Yes. But this area is not just holy to Muslims. It's also known as the Temple Mount and is the holiest place on earth for the Jewish people. And just like that, the Muslim quarter ends and the Jewish quarter begins. But there is a security checkpoint here. Shalom. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, thank you. The Western or Wailing Wall is the most famous site in the Jewish quarter. The wall was once part of the outer shell of an ancient Jewish temple that stood on the ground above. The original temple was built by King Solomon and then rebuilt and expanded by Herod the Great in 19 BC. The temple was considered to be one of the most magnificent sites of the ancient world until it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. You don't have to be Jewish to visit the wall, but you do have to cover your head to show respect. So, you should wear a hat or a scarf or a yarmulke if you're Jewish, but if you forget one, don't worry. They've got these paper yarmulkes that they hand out freely. Today, Jews from around the world come here to mourn their loss, pray, and celebrate their faith. When you get to the wall, you have a little prayer written out, which I've got right here personal prayer, so I'm sorry I'm not sharing it with you, but you put it inside the wall and then you pray. The Western Wall is a great place to take in the mind-boggling diversity of Jewish culture. Moisha Kapinski has lived here for over 10 years and is going to help me decipher some of the more perplexing dress codes on display. I keep seeing, yes, everyone's Jewish here, but they're representing uh, so many different fashions. What, what do these mean? Every single one of these people come from different parts of the world. So everybody retains the clothing they wore in those lands. In addition to that, clothing is language, meaning every piece of clothing you see that may be unusual to you is actually a, a form of an expression. I want to say something by what I wear. Let's talk about some of those expressions, like uh, like this guy's got some long Earlocks. sideburns. What do you call them? Earlock. Peot is what they're Peot? called in Hebrew. The Bible talks about not shaving around the head and leaving a tuft of hair because it was a pagan custom. Some Jews say, you know what, if that's the opportunity, I'm never going to bring a scissor to the side of my head. I'm going to grow these earlocks down. That's a symbol of love, not even a symbol of law. So that becomes the statement. Okay. Um, what about uh, the clothing, the, the black coats and this hot, hot sun? And... Right. Look, in those groups of, of wearing black, the group is divided pretty much into two. One is more worship and prayer and spirit-filled, etc., etc. And you'll find those wearing the rounded hats more. Uh, then there's the more studious types, the ones that focus on the word. God's word is a target of, of revelation. So they wear something, simple hats, short suits. Do they wear yarmulkes underneath them? So they wear yarmulkes. Yarmulkes are funny because yarmulkes are not a biblical law. Yarmulkes, the only thing biblical about them is that in the temple, the priest would cover his head when he would go into worship, or the prophet would cover his head when he would 
go into prophecy. Out of respect. Out of understanding there's something above us. About 350 years after the temple was destroyed, one man, Rabbi Huna, got up in his school and he said, you know what? I never take off my kippah because all of life is worship. His students thought that was the coolest thing they ever heard. Within a week, every single one of them were doing it. And within a year, the whole Jewish world took it up. And that custom became a law. And then women, do they have to cover themselves completely, so, legs? No, right? Jews believe that, that the, the intimacy between a husband and wife in terms of relationship is meant for that inner world, not for the outer world. Since we believe that women's hair was a way to, is one of the uh, uh, things of beauty, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that certain women will even go to the hairdresser, do their hair, and then cover it because they're only doing their hair for their husband. Mm. They're not doing it for the world. How would you explain wigs? I see some women with so wigs So since that's very difficult for some women, so the rabbi said, if, if wigs will still give the impression, you'll know that you're married, okay. but will not make you feel as if you're uh, in, embittered and imprisoned in something, so rabbis allowed those women that wanted it to, to wear wigs. So single guys see a woman with a wig, they know, don't approach her, she's taken. Exactly. Okay, so look at these guys here, they got the knickerbockers. What is that? Right. That specific group called the Gera Hasidim actually um, wear not knickers, but actually they wear regular pants and put it just into their socks. socks. That's a Polish group, actually the largest Hasidic group that came out of Poland after the Holocaust. All right, look at this guy here. This is actually looks like some of the guys in my neighborhood back in LA. Fur hats uh, was a, a custom that was adapted in Eastern Europe, and that became a sign of royalty. What you saw, which is interesting, is you saw a young man wearing it, even though it's not a Sabbath or a holiday. Those are only worn on Sabbath and holidays. If a young man got married, he and his wife are king and queen for a year. They're queen. So, so he just got married this he's year. He's been married within this year. Now, are they sweating like crazy under there? I would think so. Yeah? So think. that's all part I, of the my discipline? Family. I once asked my, my uncle. My uncle uh -huh. is a fur hat, a Hasidic. I said, how do you do it? He goes, showers. Yeah. That's the secret. Over in the Christian quarter, things can seem just as bewildering to non-Christians. I'm on the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. It's the main road in the Christian quarter, and supposedly it's the very path that Jesus took when he carried the cross to his own crucifixion. Christian pilgrims from around the world come to Jerusalem to walk the Via Dolorosa in honor of Jesus' suffering. The journey ends at the holiest Christian site in the city, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Originally built in the fifth century when Jerusalem was under Byzantine control, the Holy Sepulchre was rebuilt in the 12th century by the Crusaders. The church was constructed on what is believed to be Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified and then buried. I'm not sure if it makes a place more holy that Jesus was there or not, or you know, a place like here where they venerate a spot, whether or not it was the actual spot, you know, who knows, does that make it more holy? I don't know, but, um, but there is something just really moving to know that I was in the same space where Jesus was and that he was looking out over this view and he would have seen these hills and, um, and what he was thinking. That was really cool. I guess there's pretty good historical evidence that, that actually Golgotha was right here. So um, I guess being a Protestant, that just plays in powerfully to my bias. But getting to actually thank Jesus for what he did right where, he, where it was done, like for his love, for his grace, has been very powerful. If you want to get a different perspective on Jerusalem, then take a stroll along the old city walls. The Ramparts Walk encircles most of the old city, taking in all seven gates, and just about every stone has a story to tell. Toby still serves in the Israeli Defense Force and is well studied in Jerusalem's long and bloody history of siege and conquest. Wow, great view from up here, huh? Yeah, definitely. This wall here, it feels like it's been here forever. Well, you know, it's not as ancient as you think. It was built in the 16th century by the Ottoman Empire. They were a Turkish Muslim empire. Uh -huh. They were actually here from the 16th century till the British came in 1918, 1917. If you just want to take a look out in Jerusalem, you'll notice that not only the Turkish Empire here, but there are different empires here. You could see the mosques, you could see the churches, you could see the synagogues. 
A lot of different influences, yeah? Definitely different influences and different empires. And each empire actually built a wall. So everyone felt they could leave their mark with a wall. They used it for protection. They also ruined it, so the next one couldn't use it as protection, so the next one actually had to build it. The walls may not be as old as they look, but hidden deep beneath Damascus Gate, you can still find remnants of an earlier age. Here you can actually see the wall change as we go deeper. It's like we're going back in time. Well, we're descending 1,400 years what? from the 16th century to the second century Roman period. This is Roman? This is Roman. Oh, wow. This is about 100 years after Christ. This was a hall this is for a treat. the Roman guards. And what were they guarding? Yes, what were they guarding? Let me show you. Damascus Gate, the Ottoman Turkish gate, was built upon in classical Roman gate, which is basically a gate divided by three gates three entrances, one big one, and two on the side. Oh, yeah. This is the eastern one. See the actual pillars. You can actually see the pillars, and do you remember the uh, Roman guard room we were just in? Just in here. Here's the original foundations of the Roman guard room ah. that we were just sitting inside. And there's the street level of today. That is the street level of today. This is all buried. But come, we'll go see more. This, if we climb up wild. to the top of the wall. After the Romans, the old city walls remained unchanged for hundreds of years until the rise of the Byzantine Empire, when the walls were expanded. Moving from Damascus Gate to Jaffa Gate, you pass through the Christian Quarter, established during the Byzantine period. Byzantine, talk to me in years here. Well, Byzantine, fourth century. Okay. Constantine basically turned his empire to a complete Christian empire. So he went from Roman to Christian Roman. Yep. So if this is the Christian quarter, why is there a mosque right here? Well, we are in the Christian quarter, but the Byzantine Empire only lasted till about the seventh century when they were conquered by the Muslim Empire. This was the time Muhammad, his second successor, Omar, conquered Jerusalem in 638 and basically turned the entire city, entire city of Jerusalem that used to be pagan, then Christian, now it was Muslim. And this was continuous pretty much till about the 20th century. The walls that survive today date from the 16th century and the reign of the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. During their construction, a number of state-of-the-art features were included to better defend the city. One of them is very effective against tall people. I mean, yeah, well, by the way, watch your head. Yeah, now you tell me. The wall's defenses must have worked. The Ottomans managed to hold on to Jerusalem for nearly 300 years right up to World War I, when the British took control of the city. But before going, the Ottomans managed to make one final mark on the city's walls here at Jaffa Gate. If you come up here, well, take a look. You'll notice that we're at a dead end. Yeah. Basically, the wall doesn't really continue. It's kind of like a slice right in the wall. Yeah, it just gets cut right off. It was taken down towards the end of the Ottoman Empire. Wilhelm II, a German Kaiser, decided to come visit Jerusalem. And he said that he wasn't willing to come through Jaffa Gate, but he wanted a wider road, so he and his wife, Augusta Victoria, could come in with the royal entrance. The Sultan commanded to take down the wall, the wall that stood here since the 16th century, take it down and build a road into Jaffa Gate. This guy must have been some guy, Wilhelm II. He for definitely the, was. He, the Sultan broke down part of his fort. True. Moving from Jaffa Gate to Zion Gate, you can see evidence of a much more recent episode in the city's history, the 1948 Israeli War of Independence. This is Zion Gate. It is beautiful. See all those marks up in the front? Yeah. Well, part of those marks are actually bullet holes from 1948. That recently? That recently. The Arabs and the Jews had a war over Israel, and the Jordanians took over the old city. The Jewish army wanted to come and conquer the city, the problem was they weren't really organized. They didn't really know what they were doing. It was a bunch of 18-year-olds and people off the boat who didn't really speak the language. And they came here, not sleeping three nights. The soldiers fell asleep on their weapons, fell asleep during the attacks, and just couldn't hold their own. We lost the old city in 1948. It took us another 19 years. In 1967, there was the Six-Day War, and that is when Jerusalem was conquered by the Jews. And under the Jewish authority, under the Israeli authority, until today. That could have been you in the army. Don't girls serve here? Well, yeah. Um, army here is 
compulsory. Uh -huh. um, guys have to do three years, girls do two. I served my two years. I am still in reserves. And uh, yeah, we all serve in the army. It's our country. And uh, we fight to defend it. It's the one country for Jews and where you could be a Jew and not have to hide for being a Jew or as we know in history, something's happened. And so every citizen serves here to hold our own country. And we don't have to live in the diaspora anymore. Just opposite the old city is one of the holiest hills in the world. Many churches and shrines have been built here on sites believed to be important to the life of Jesus. But much of the hill is covered by the oldest Jewish cemetery in the world, and its significance is not just historical. Many Jews from around the globe long to be buried here, because this place is believed to be where Jerusalem's past and future will collide. Aharon is a local guide well-versed in the histories of the end of days. Why does everyone want to be buried here throughout the ages? Well, it's connected to the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about the Valley of Dry Bones. From that scripture, there is a belief that in the end days, there will be a resurrection from the dead. Now you mentioned end of days, that's a Christian belief as well. It's not only a Christian belief, it's a Jewish belief, it's a, a Muslim belief. And here on the Mount of Olives, somewhere around here, we don't know exactly where, he, meaning the Messiah, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The valley will split in two. The belief among Christians and Jews is that the Messiah will walk in through that gate, which will somehow open. So the one that's closed up? Correct, that's the golden gate. Now, I don't know if everyone's gonna be happy to see the Messiah when he comes, because according to Judaism, Islam and Christianity, it's also gonna be the day of judgment. And the day of judgment, it's, this valley down here is called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. In Hebrew, Jehoshaphat means God will judge. And in the prophet Joel, it says that God is going to bring the nations and judge them in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I'm getting a little nervous that the ground's gonna open up right while I'm here. I'd like to kind of go, or maybe this is the best place to be. Sadly, there are some people who get very, very religious. Here in Jerusalem, there is actually a mental institution, <laughs> and each year, about 100 people are admitted really? with what is called the Jerusalem Syndrome. And there's actually a story about someone who was admitted there who was going around calling himself Elijah the prophet, and someone said to him, who told you that you are Elijah the prophet? And he said, God himself told me. And a voice from the other side of the room said, no, I didn't. <laughs> Whether or not you believe the Messiah will return to the Mount of Olives, you can be sure of one thing. The summit offers some of the best views of the old city. With so much holiness in the air, you might be surprised to know that Jerusalem has a thriving nightlife. But things were not always so free and easy. Yanni grew up here and remembers a time when a night out in the Jewish part of town could end in tragedy. The place we're sitting right now, uh, which is called Resto Bar, um, was called Cafe Moment. And in March of 2002, a suicide bomber walked into this cafe right where we're sitting right now and, um, and blew himself up and killed, if I remember correctly, 11 people. Uh, people sitting here, just like you and me, drinking their coffee or their beer or their, you know, having dinner. Um, and Life just ended for them in a split second. You know, life was altered forever. In the mid-90s, there was a period of bus bombings. I physically got off buses more than one time um, when someone who looked, got on the bus looked suspicious to me. Do you still feel that today? No. No? no. Why? What do you think? Um, uh... The last couple of years, the last few years, there's been sort of ups and downs throughout the last 20 years or so. I mean, there have been more intense periods, less intense periods. So you think there will be peace here? If it's, if it's up to me, <laughs> um, I pray for that. I really hope so, for all of our sake. 
I mean, I really believe we're, st we're here together. We're, our faiths are intertwined right now. Our futures are intertwined. And it's up to us to take that step and do what it, what's necessary to make sure that it's a positive, it's a bright future. Together. Together. Yeah. Together. Absolutely. Despite its Jewish identity, many Israelis have Arabic origins with strong ties to Palestine. In recent times, a controversial wall has been built by the Israeli government, separating parts of Israel from the Palestinian territories. The stated aim is to protect Israel from terrorist attacks, but the wall has come to symbolize the divide. Jerusalem's proximity to the West Bank makes it an ideal starting point for those wishing to see how the other half, the Palestinians, live. If you want to go into the Palestinian West Bank, it's really not that hard as long as you know what to do. First of all, you can't have an Israeli passport because they're not allowed into many parts of the West Bank, like Ramallah, where I want to go. And secondly, you want to leave from East Jerusalem, whether it be on a taxi with East Jerusalem license plate, get a local car hire here, or go on a public bus like I am. Ramallah is only 15 kilometers north of Jerusalem, but journey times are hard to predict as military checkpoints and route diversions can cause delays. So you're going to Ramallah, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's going on over there? Just going to see some friends, yeah. Do you go there often? Yeah. But you live here? I live in the old city of Jerusalem, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, how is it? Is it easy to get there or to hassle you a little it bit? It depends. Yeah. It's, uh, these days it's easy to get there, but the way back might be a little tricky. I see. Yeah. This wall looks really new. Uh, when was this put up? They've been working on it for a few years now. Okay. So what was it it's before? A shame, really. before? It was just, uh, you would see the landscape, but now it's cut. Was there a fence or anything? No. no it's just... It was open. So now they're really putting up a permanent division between these two. Exactly, yeah. How does that feel for you? It's not nice. It's not nice? No. You liked it better when it was open? Of course. I mean, who would want this, you know? Now, is it really safe for me or is it is it dangerous? Because back where I'm from, it's in the news, like, stay out, this is danger zone, you know. Think it's before you it's go always in. scarier on TV. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's not as scary as it seems on TV. But sometimes you, there's a little bit of action. But it's I wouldn't say it's dangerous. And how do they take to tourists like myself? They like tourists. Oh, they do. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you if you learn some Arabic words, uh -huh. shukran, marhaba, stuff like that. Yeah, shukran means uh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. What, what else should I learn? Uh, salam. Salam. Yeah. Okay. Stuff like that. They, they get really that, excited. Yeah. 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 The only scary thing is the checkpoint itself. Okay. That's mostly the problem. And what could happen to you at the checkpoint? Why is that scary? Just, you know, the fact that it might really take you a long time to go back home, you know, when you're being searched and stuff. Always depends, you know. Uh, a few years ago it was worse, but it's okay now. That was it, now we're in Ramallah? That's it, We yeah. didn't even get stopped, they didn't, nobody checked our passport, nothing. Yeah, but that's, that's because we're going in. The way out is a little bit different. Okay. Now we're in Ramallah. Ramallah is one of the largest cities in the West Bank, and by far the most progressive. Young, hip, and bursting with energy, even the traffic police here are cool. Check this guy out. Uh, like the center. Uh, everybody comes from around the villages and stuff to come here. When you go into Ramallah, you're really going somewhere, I guess. You know, this is this is this is the New York. This is their this is their city. I really feel like I'm at home more here than I do in the U.S. because my father's from here, and we usually follow follow our father's heritage. 
and uh, people really make you feel welcome. And I, you know, I've, I've never had a problem here going anywhere I want to go. And I just, I just feel at home. I really feel at home when I'm here. It, it's vibrant here. It is. There's life here, and you feel it. The youth is Ramallah. You see, like they That's say here. That's what livens it up. That's what makes it lively here. The it's, Shabab. The Shabab. The youth. The Shabab. The youth. The youth. I was born here, so I have a lot of friends. It's like we live in another world. So we enjoy our time. We do. Yeah. yeah. Living in Ramallah, we're basically far from all the events that are happening with the occupation. It's rare that you have an encounter with the occupation or with the soldier, with the army, or anything. So it's kind of normal here. My grandfather is, is from a small city near Gaza. So he came here and he can go there. Uh, we're American citizens, you know. When we go to uh, Israel, to Jerusalem, to go pray in uh, the Quds, they, like me and him been here for two months, they won't, they won't let us in. We're American citizens. They yeah. always give us a runaround, tell us to go back. We haven't went in there one time, you know, the Dome of the Rock. We try to go there and they just send us back. Sometimes I feel intimidated because, you know, they single you out out of everybody else, you know. If they see your, the way you look or whatever, they just let you go and just by, uh, like, you know, their skin color or something, just like in America, same way. Of course, hope must always be there. But no, we don't feel like it's our home. It's a small piece of land compared to the historical territory of Palestine. People who lived on the coast, on Jaffa, Haifa, Akka, they came here, you know. It's, they're still our home there, too. But we can't even get there, even for a visit. Culturally, this place has more in common with its neighbors in Jordan than Israel. And the best way to understand a culture is through its food. So, time to start eating. There we go. What do we got here? What do we got? Falafel. Falafel? Falafel. It's uh, chickpeas. Chickpeas. Yes. What else is in that? It's onion, parsley. It's very delicious. They have a lot of protein. You taste it? Yeah. All right. If you dip it with hummus, it's more delicious. Dude. OK. Chickpeas dipped in hummus. They have a lot of seasoning oh in God. it, though. That is full of flavor. That's yes. really good. Thank you. What's the secret? It yours tastes different than anybody else's. Yeah, well, we have it for, we doing this for the last 60 years, though. You inherited this restaurant? Yes. From your grandparents grand, or your, your grand, parents? Grand, grand. It's the best, though. No, seriously, this is, this is really, I don't know what, you got some secret ingredient, I think. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We do. Keep it up, we man. We a big family. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran. Okay. Now, time for dessert, Palestinian style. Top of the list is the local favorite, ice cream made with Arabic gum. Sounds, uh, chewy. I was told I have to try this. Arabic ice cream? Arabic gums, yes. It looks like ice cream. But uh, different tests. You guys have falafel flavor? No. <laughs> <laughs> Shawarma. Oh, right. Definitely the pineapple. Pineapple. The rum raisin. Rum raisin. You like the lemon one, right? Lemon, yes, good. All right, that should be good. Oh, the cherry on top. Oh, nice. Thank yeah. you. This is so fun. It's thick, I'm telling you. It's almost like candy, but it's cold. Mm. That is delicious. Following the Arab-Israeli War of 1967, the Palestinian West Bank was occupied by Israeli forces. But over the years, Palestinian autonomy has been partly restored to a number of areas, including Ramallah. Today, Ramallah is home to the Palestinian Authority and the tomb of one of its most famous leaders, Yasser Arafat. Considered by many to be the father of the modern Palestinian liberation movement, Yasser Arafat died in 2005. And shortly after, this impressive monument was built in his honor. Apparently this is a memorial for the tomb which is below us, but it's not open to the public. Arafat has become somewhat of a hero, and people from all over the world come to this site to pay tribute. It's been opened only two years ago, and I mean, it's a grave, but graves can be very pretty, and I think this is very well made. How far have you come? Where are you from? Uh, we are from Indonesia. What does Yasser Arafat mean to you? Well, uh, he was a very 
great uh, Palestinian. Uh, he really defends Palestinian people. He was a very brave person and we can learn much from him. His uh, most famous sentence is that uh, Jerusalem will be the, the capital of, uh, of uh, Palestine and he didn't give up from Jerusalem and uh, Jerusalem will be part of uh, Palestine. This tower here has a green laser beam that shoots out in the direction of Jerusalem to remind everybody of their desire to someday have a place in Jerusalem. But word is that the Israeli army uh, didn't take a liking to it and made them turn it off. I can only say to anybody who is interested in visiting new places and new experiences, they should really come here. This We have not had any moments of fear or, or, or any kind of doubts or something ever since we got here. It's amazing. Even the soldiers, I mean, German soldiers can be very different, but even the soldiers are very friendly around here. The Palestinian struggle is always evolving new forms of expression, and some of the most eye-catching can be found along the Palestinian side of the separation wall. Destroy. Happy holidays. You know, from a distance, this looks like a wall just splattered with graffiti, but as I'm getting up close to it, I'm finding it's actually an expression of the people, and I actually feel more connected with them as I'm reading their thoughts. It's, uh, it's a peaceful way to get it off your chest and just permanently post it up on a wall for everyone to read. Anybody can do it. And uh, oh, look, here's one. Banksy, a girl holding balloons, trying to float up over this wall. How's it going? Hey. So, uh, what are you writing up there? Control, Alt, and Delete. What does that mean? This uh, wall is surrounding us everywhere. It uh, controls our movement and uh, it separates us from our relatives and our land on the other side. So. Uh, for me, I don't want to see it here for a long time. Uh -huh. I remember three years ago, we draw Gandhi here on the wall. You were one of the first ones to do it? Yeah, it was one of the first. Uh -huh. uh, now, three years after, you can see the whole wall is full with paintings, graffiti, slogans and everything. People from all around the world come to do their things here. So you watched this wall mm -hmm. being put up. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you first saw it starting? Well, uh, first it was fear, but uh, then it uh, challenged me to do something. And uh, I didn't stop doing things against this wall since uh, it was, uh, they started to build it. So is this going all the way around the West Bank? Yeah, yeah. And most of the times it's not on the border between the West Bank and Israel. Sometimes it's inside the West Bank, and this is the problem. Sometimes it cuts right into the West Bank? Yes. So you've got part of the West Bank on one side, part of the West Bank on the other side? Yes, and uh, many times uh, the wall separates Palestinians from Palestinians, not Palestinians from Israelis. A lot of places along the wall I see free Palestine. What, you guys aren't allowed to go across the wall or what? It's very difficult to move even inside the West Bank from one village to another village, from one city to another city. Sometimes it takes you hours waiting on the checkpoint. So your goal is for this wall to just be done? Yes. And Control, all delete? Yeah. There will be no peace with the walls. If you want to build peace, we need to build bridges, not ah. walls. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that uh, both the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis want to live. This is why they're still here. Uh, until now, maybe they didn't uh, understand each other, but when they reach one day, they will reach it. It should be based on uh, mutual respect and understanding and trust for the other. And that's it. It will be solved easily. Well, good luck, man. Thank you. Control, alt, delete that thing. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> for now, the barrier is a reality. And it extends in the form of a wall or barbed wire fence for some 450 miles, often encroaching on Palestinian land, confusing borders, and safeguarding Jewish settlements within the West Bank. But the West Bank isn't just about protest. Ramallah is renowned for its bars, clubs, and watering holes. And I feel a mighty thirst coming on. Well, Ramallah has proven itself to be a pretty hip city. I'm actually at the hippest hotspot in town. It's called the Snow Bar, and it's on the outskirts of town. 
that this place has whiskey, vodka, rum, tequila. They've even got their own home-brewed Palestinian beer. Beer me. Beer. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Taiba. And I think traveling in the West Bank is great. I think a lot of people are afraid to come because they, you know, they see the news and they hear stories and they think it's all, you know, scary and dangerous and whatever. And uh, at Ramallah and the West Bank, I mean, it's full of surprises. Um, you come here, you meet great people. People are very hospitable. You're always offered food, you're always offered drinks. Um, people come to party, people come to hang out. And it's just, just the kind of stuff nobody would expect. The West Bank constitutes over four-fifths of all Palestinian-occupied land. About 85% of the population is Sunni Muslim, and 2% are Christian, most of them living in holy cities like Bethlehem, which houses the Church of the Nativity, where Jesus Christ was born. The church, funded by Byzantine Emperor Constantine back in AD 326, welcomes over a million pilgrims a year and stands as the oldest basilica in the world. We wanted to see the last journey of Jesus Christ, where he was crucified, and we want to also see where he was born. From our experience, the both sides were very safe. Uh, we didn't have any, any problem, any conflicts. We didn't feel unsafe. I think that we are very much affected by news, because they always show, uh, they always show the, you know, only bad things happening around the world. Uh, I think it's quite a peaceful place. Bethlehem itself is a typical market town that reflects the agricultural economy which shapes the West Bank. It's amazing to think that two-thirds of the agriculturally based work in the region is performed by women, such as this co-op which produces Maftu, a locally grown couscous. Ancient towns like Jericho are also born out of agricultural prosperity. Here, traditional methods of cultivation are still practiced, especially in date production, which has become a major Palestinian export, and olives, which have become the source of life and dignity in the occupied lands. However, there is conflict, as farmers and the ever-growing Jewish settler population battle for control of this biblical land of milk and honey. In the town of Nahalim, settlers encroaching on Palestinian farmlands have even forced farmers to employ foreign volunteers during the olive harvest for fear of reprisals. There is sometimes aggression, there is sometimes uh, stories of settlers cutting the trees with saws uh, just to harass the farmers, and it's basically an international solidarity to show to the farmers that we're with them and also to show that uh, to the Israeli government that there are a lot of people interested in visiting Palestine, you know, even as tourists, so why make all the fuss? It's a real mix between um, sort of joy and misery because it is so joyful to be together and helping, but at the same time to see what's happening here is, is very heartbreaking for everyone. The illegal settlements are encroaching more and more onto Palestinian land. The separation barrier which snakes through the land can quite often cut off a village from its um, agricultural land so they can't access very easily their, their crops. It's a land grab and taking quite a lot of um, land from the, from the farmers so they can't get to their olives, or if they can, they get harassment, they get lots of, lots of problems. For the cause of security, uh, farmers are, have their lands confiscated and, well, they can't do anything about it. If an olive orchard is declared a military zone, you can't access it. And in Israel, the law says that if you're absent for three years in your fields, the, the land will uh, become property of the state. So this means if it's a military zone and you can't access the field, then what can you do as a farmer? So that means that your land is being automatically confiscated. I'm heading 30 miles southeast through a land claimed by both Israel and the Palestinians to the Dead Sea. At nearly 1,400 feet below sea level, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth and one of the world's natural wonders. A swim in its waters is an experience not to be missed and a perfect way to end my journey. 
Somewhere beyond this forest of reeds here lies the Dead Sea. It's kind of eerie. It smells of sulfur. There it is! I made it! Ah, oh, it's warm. It's warm. Oh. Whoa, I'm floating like crazy here. Ah, oh, it stings. A little bit. Oh, it's salty. Wow. I've never felt so light. I'm buoyant. My feet are floating. Maybe this is how Jesus walked on water. The water's high salt content makes it much thicker than normal seawater and creates extra buoyancy. It also makes it virtually impossible for fish to survive here, hence the name. Across the sea there is Jordan. I'm somewhere on the confusing divide between Palestinian West Bank and Israel, and maybe it's just as well, I don't know. For such a small place, I feel like I've traveled the continent and passed through the ages of civilization. My experience has been incredible, the scenery breathtaking, and despite the conflicts that have gone on here for millennia, the people I've met have been kind and generous to a fault, be they Jewish, Muslim, Christian, or whatever. They say it'll take a miracle to bring peace to this land, but after all, this is the land of miracles, isn't it? about this job is you capture life as it happens. There's always something worth capturing on film. I'm gonna go play a trick on uh, Steve, the director. Too late. <laughs> you stop it and nothing. Um, I'm sorry, can you remind me one more time? What are we supposed to tell Aviv when we find her? Are we gonna tell Aviv? Oh my god, we just had a two hour briefing. I, I get it now. Tel Aviv's a city. Uh, today we've gone from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. Magir there, Nigel. Magir. Yeah, we love it. We yeah, love it. Just, every time we move, we gotta bring everything. Every time we fly, we gotta bring everything. It takes a man with big muscles to move this. This thing is light, it's empty. <laughs> At the moment, I think it's not the Jesus Trail, but the oil, oil trail. trail. The oil trail. We can get it. This is a bad leak. Uh, there's a system that uh, brings back the oil into the into the engine, uh -huh. and it's. <laughs> I can't say what that. What are we gonna do? You guys are the professionals at mishap, so I don't know what to say. I mean, for us to keep the show on the road, we don't need to bring all the gear that's in the van. We just need our camera, a few tapes, sound gear is all on him. In 10 minutes, a minibus will arrive. It'll take us. Where's the star? He's in his, he's he's in his, his Whitney Baco. Here I am. More champagne. No, I didn't think we had enough time to film what we wanted to do today as it was. Now with a broken down vehicle. No lunch and no wee break. So maybe if we don't drink, we won't need to wee. Yeah! Yeah! So I'm going to move all this rubbish from this van into the other van and then get on filming. Regardless of your beliefs, and no matter what you think you already know about this place, when you get here, 3.30 in the afternoon, these guys have been here since 9 o'clock. They're just really temperamental and uh, quite scared, so it's difficult to make them look calm on camera and get them to where we need to be. You're not done yet. Come here. I found out it was a wild 
camel. We were told we were getting tourist camels and uh, we were taming the wild, so. Oh, I know. Come here. Come here. Come here. And even today, it continues to stir deep passions around the globe. Uh, yeah. Today is our last day. Hi, camel. Salam alaikum. Looking forward to uh, completing the show. I think it's going to be a good one. I don't normally say that. Actually, yeah, I do. Yeah, I always say that. Way. <laughs> All our shows are good. Yeah. Uh, I think this one especially is going to be really, really cool. You can find out more about this series on our website. Programs from the Globe Trekker series are available on DVD and now on demand from GlobetrekkerChannel.tv. Music from the series is available on CD. You can also order the new Globe Trekker Annual featuring information on festivals, events, and outdoor activities. A companion book, Great Festivals of the World, is also available. To order Globe Trekker products, visit the website. <laughs>